Great. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back? Great. So I will expect you to get my attention if you need me to speak up or readjust my mic. Uh, mics are not meant for women's clothes. So if you need my attention, just wave big. I am, as you heard, a musicologist. I am also someone who is especially qualified to teach a class on weddings because I eloped. <laughs> so all of my knowledge of weddings is information that I have constructed by virtue of kind of cultural analysis and uh, my view is not colored by my own habits and preferences. So there you go, I'm a neutral reporter. We're going to be talking this semester about a variety of uh, experiences of ceremonial and I have chosen to organize the class a bit chronologically but we over like each class overlaps with the one before and I'm trying to use the time frame of the class to uh, draw your attention to the different kinds of evidence that we have regarding weddings regarding funerals and regarding the sound surrounding ceremonial because while we in our modern culture tend to think of the one event the wedding, which will be at one o'clock in the church. Sting the bands. You've probably thought about betrothal. Well, for the Middle Ages, betrothal was often a more important ceremony than the wedding itself. We'll get hints of that today and talk about it uh, more fully in a later class. So we're going to look at case studies, and I'm going to throw in sort of I tried to find four really significant ones, but there's a lot of evidence. And so we're going to do a bit of a bath, in, to, particularly today. Too many pictures. You're not going to get to spend a lot of time looking at all of them. Fortunately, the PowerPoint goes up after I'm done. And we'll be watching a few videos over the course of each of the classes. Being centered in a music discipline, I love the music. I am here to tell you today is not a preface to all of the music that follows. The later music is lovely, today's is not. Please don't use today to judge the whole of the class because you'll never come back. You'll see what I mean by the end of the hour. We're going to talk about music art, a bit about fashion, we're going to talk about pageantry, we're going to talk about evidence. So it should be a really interesting mix and I am glad to take your questions. I have been advised that to get through the material I should probably start keeping you on track. Um, but I will try for some to and fro in each of the classes over the course of this semester. Fine. Course outline. Wanted to know sort of where you're going specifically. So we have only six classes and boy did it hurt to cut things out of the syllabus over the last couple of weeks because there's just a ton of stuff out there and particularly when you get in the 16th century, the music is gorgeous and so by judicious pruning, we're going to keep it to six classes. And one of the things I do pledge is to give you sort of listening lists. Again, those will be after lectures are completed. You heard from my administrative portfolio. I'm a little bit easy with the provost's business. Um, so I, it's a little bit of a scramble to get the hand, handouts together before the lecture. But I can tell you afterwards what we've listened to. Uh, and you'll have access to the visuals through the PowerPoints. So we're going to talk today about iconography. We're going to look at art. Um, and by art, I, I think I cut the tapestry example out uh, in the interest of time. So we're going to look at paintings, and we're going to look at illuminations. Illuminations being those pictures that are included in manuscripts that have um, illumination technically means they've got burnished gold in them, so they're really lovely. And if you want to go look at them in libraries, they're usually in either display cases or locked to the public, and you have to present credentials to go look at them. Fortunately, there are all kinds of images on the web. We'll also talk a bit about cultural practice to kind of give you a framework for some aspects of the wedding ceremonial. Week two, we'll pick up with more iconographical evidence. We'll talk more on the sadder part of life, uh, the close of life ceremonials. So requiems, 
um, and the Office of the Dead, and then Deploration, uh, the Deplorations, the Laments on the Deaths of Famous Musicians as our case studies. Third week, we're going to look at the happy side, the betrothal ceremonies, and the kind of cycle of ceremonial over the course of a 15th century elaborate high wedding. Um, that information, 14th and 15th century, uh, that's where we actually get a lot of our assumptions around what princesses do. So I think of that as the Disney week. Um, but I hope that you will uh, um, take a, a, from the music itself an understanding of the way in which musical complexity forms part of a basically a positioning culturally about what our court is doing and your court doesn't have the resources to pull off. So it's a kind of social assertion that the ceremonial is trying to make a political argument. We know that weddings are all about the marriage of two dynastic families. Well, here is how that actually works. The fourth week, we get into gifts, parties. We're going to talk about peasant weddings, because uh, that's a whole genre. Uh, and we'll look at what it is they are depicting and why that's important. But we'll also look at the kind of uh, Tudor gift culture and the way in which that shapes out our reception of music for the 16th century. We move into the end of the course with one of the most fabulously documented weddings, that of 1568. There were three, not one, not two, but three published books about that particular wedding. No agenda here. We're all just happen to want to tell the story of how beautiful the wedding was. It's got pictures, it's got music, it's got Orlando de Vilasso as a composer. Doesn't get any better than 1568. Um, and then at the very last bit of the course, I will talk about my recent research on bidden weddings, which are a folk tradition in northwestern England um, involving newspaper advertisements, inviting people to come to the wedding. So a whole range of different kinds of practices that you'll be seeing over time. Great. So now I'm actually going to make you talk. You are thinking back to the Middle Ages. I've evoked your Disney Channel already. So you're trying to figure out how it is that you are going to convey to somebody who's just walked up to your picture and has no context that it is a wedding going on. So what are the things, the people, the places that are going to signal this is a wedding in the Middle Ages? So if you'll just chat with your neighbor for two minutes, then I'm going to have you give me your information forward. If you need to pop up and find yourself a neighbor, please do. Two minutes, go. And so I'm going to have you bring them forward. What are the things that you think would help to symbolize a wedding when you are painting the picture either on tablet or in a manuscript? And I like to start from the back, so we'll do that back corner. Give me a something. There's probably going to be an officiant, somebody doing the celebrating for them. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. So. We'll talk about why in a few minutes. Uh, something else? The location. And what do you think the location is going to look like? The cathedral is definitely one of our modern tropes. We know that weddings are going to take place in churches. They will later. The Middle Ages, not so much. Great. Something else? Yep. Food. There's always going to be some sort of feast. And that feast is going to be terrifically elaborate. Hand clasp. Some sort of signal of the togetherness of the couple. Also as well. Mm hmm Usually one on top. Sometimes they're folded in between. We'll talk a little bit about why. 
Um, and now I've called enough on specific groups. Tell me something else. Indicators of wealth. Um, yep, that's a good one because, of course, these are political moments. You are on the stage. Everybody's looking. Something else? Rings. Rings are sometimes used. Sometimes there are other objects, which I find fascinating because I was brought up with the ring tradition. Parents with pleased looks. It is always glad when uh, you're always glad when you finish a legal contract, and this is the most important legal contract that those parents will be negotiating over time. It is also that moment of celebration, the the kind of bestowal of independent adulthood. A dog, yep, actually, we do have pictures of pets. There are dogs, there's a chicken, there's one with a goat. I don't know why the goat's there. <laughs> Lamb, uh, signaling the Christian iconography, so you'll sometimes get that. Purity, sometimes you do, get, um, you do get symbols of purity. Sometimes you will see that she's, uh, later pictures, you sometimes see that she's got her religious book um, in a pocket book, which is tied to the belt. So they had books that actually, instead of covers, were essentially opened out as cloth bags, and she might wear that as part of the wedding to signal that she is going into a Christian marriage. Hmm? Kids. Uh, sometimes you will see pictures of children, particularly for second marriage, someone coming along. The children of the um, bride and groom may be depicted because that is a signal of their endorsement of this new alliance. Sometimes you will have the suppression of the children um, because that is maybe not such a happy moment or it wasn't the point of the image. And um, for many of the lower class weddings, um, there are often children before there are weddings, uh, but then those aren't the kinds of weddings that tend to uh, wind up with paid illustrators. So we don't have as much visual evidence for that social practice. Flowers? Flowers, uh, flowers are usually in the background, um, but not as uh, bouquets. So that's a bit different. Bouquets come in more in the 17th and 18th century. Um, and I have always assumed that that's partly the um, richness of the garden being signaled. Um, but you will have backdrops of flowers, and many of the pictures, as we'll see in a few minutes, can wind up being outdoors. Last one or two things. Elaborate dress, but thank you for not saying white dress. Because one of the things I, I spend a lot of time teaching people, white dresses are Queen Victoria. That's very late in our wedding tradition. As we will see in our pictures here, the bride wore blue. Um, thank you so much. Blue is a standard color. It's a rich color. You had to use elaborate dyes to make a deep uh, blue robe. And so blue is one of the cut it colors that you will have for weddings. This is the betrothal. So I remember I said there's the betrothal and the wedding. I'm cheating a little bit. But it was a nice image and it was early enough. Um, so there she is. She's wearing blue. You'll see the funky things with the hands. You'll see in this case you got an efficient. Somebody mentioned the ceremonial um, action of the cleric that's part of the ceremony. You see the happy families in the background. In this picture, Marie of Brabant, on the other hand, is wearing, she's got her blue robe with uh, the fleur de lis. She's got the really deep uh, uh, fur lining her sleeves. So I actually have, not for Marie herself, but for one of her contemporaries, Philippa of Lancaster. For Philippa, we have a lot of legal documents uh, that, actually it's account books, that come down uh, that involve her wedding to the King Eric of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden. So this is right around 1406. So she commissions a brand new robe of blue velvet made as a tunic with kirkcote au vert, uh, so an open front piece, and a trained mantle, something dragging along the ground, so you have a use for your page. Um, and it is edged, for Philippa at least, with 13 ermine 
and then lined on the inside, so this white kind of fabric in there, with pured miniver. Now, miniver is a little animal, um, and it's mostly brown. And so you would take the miniver fur, and you would cut out all the brown bits, and you're left with this little patch of white. And then you stitched these little patches pontillistically into the inside of the coat so that it is nice and warm. Why, in the early 15th century, for heaven's sakes, are they making fur wedding gowns? Because this is the mini ice age. It's colder than the Dickens. And so you wanted something warm to wear. So while this is not, in fact, Philippa, it seems to be a gown not so different than that of her near contemporary. The thing about the decision to use miniver and something that this tells us about luxury practice is that for Philippa's dress, it took 2,114 miniver furs. So you are making a statement about your access to wealth, about your access to the production of the countryside, about the style of life um, that you are going to take on in this new marriage. Um, so obviously not white, but with white touches, fur because it's cold, um, and uh, you can see that no one really is out there in the purity of white clothing that we think of as a more modding, modern garb. Confirmation that this is normal, normal. here is Louis X and his uh, wife Clemence. Uh, she is wearing red, her uh, handband is wearing blue. Um, so it's a nice colorful event. You will notice that they are outside standing in front of what appears to be a church rather than inside the church proper. That's going to matter to us. Again, a couple of more. Um, this is an initial from an initial, so it's in a manuscript. You can see all of the words around it. This is actually the letter G. Uh, you have to look at it really carefully to figure that out. Um, but it does actually lead into the text that follows. Um, this is an item. I do not know where it landed. I only have the auction house picture from it. It sold about a decade ago. Um, but you notice that he is giving her something looks like it might be a ring. If it is a ring, it's got a big uh, sig uh, signet on it. So um, they are doing something. She is again wearing a cloak with a fur lining. It's in blue. She's got uh, her best dress, presumably. And last but not least, here we have a sort of a, a metaphorical wedding. This is the Virgin, um, Virgin Mary, who is being married. And you will notice here, we talked a little bit about the hands. She has her hands coming together, and his hands are on the outside getting ready to clasp. We'll talk a moment uh, in a couple of minutes about hand fasting. That's a very feudal gesture. She is essentially promising to give homage uh, in the course of the marriage. So rings versus hand fasting. Rings are what we think of. We're ring people. We have been trained as Americans to know that weddings are about the rings. And there are lovely rings in the medieval um, registry of art. Um, they don't all fit really well. I think of this as the medieval donut moment. Um, I don't know if they had trouble like picturing something small or if, if the rings were largely oversized. I think this one is symbolic. Um, but you do find that they don't fit like our modern gold bands, that they are meant to be larger statements when you have them. Um, so this uh, little um, uh, initial from the British Library uh, is one of the larger, less beautiful, but deeply symbolic representations of rings. But you have them. Oh, yeah, it does look like a donut. Um, and there, if you ever are bored, uh, medieval Twitter has a, a donut sub theme. Um, don't ask, but that's uh, one of the social media fun things to talk about. Um, here you have a picture of um, a marriage ceremony with the groom. Let's see, does that actually? Ha! Huh? 
You have a ring there. It's, again, a very large ring. Looks like it could even be a bracelet. But it has a stone, um, and that is a nice telling detail. Uh, sorry, the right one gets a little blurry, but I wanted to, again, here's the, um, if you look at the larger page, it's again um, from a manuscript. You can see that he is putting something on her finger. Um, it's not as clear as I might like, but again, back to that notion that in the marriage moment, we are going to have the ring. Um, here's a woodcut doing uh, more or less the same thing. Gentleman, whoops, sorry. Um, uh, gentleman, ring, lady, receiving, no celebrant. We'll come back to that. And again, the mystic marriage. So one of the reasons that we, in our understanding of the Middle Ages, know that marriages are always about rings is that there are a number of iconographical traditions that show various saints or various women monastics in the mystical marriage with Christ. And in those illustrations, it's almost always the ring that is used as the symbol of her dedication to marriage to God, the eternal, the ring as the symbol of the the eternal life. It's also the kind of cycle of her stepping out of the secular world and committing herself to this life of, um, well, in Catherine's case, uh, sainthood or for a rig religious monastic, a life in the community devoted to prayer. So rings wind up one of our central images. And I think that that has, in fact, colored the way that we think about at what we look for in medieval marriages, because that religious part of the tradition is one of the ones that dominates. If you go into the National Gallery, you get lots and lots of religious pictures. We have only a few pictures of more secular ceremonies. And so we're trained to look for rings. If the ring isn't there, you think, oh, forgot the ring, or was focused on the hand gesture. There's always an explanation. And yet, if you go back to the documents, you'll find that there was usually a gift, but that a lot of the time, and particularly in the high Middle Ages, and particularly for the rank one down from royalty, the gifts were not rings. Instead, the gifts were of a variety of sorts, but most commonly, the other half of a coin. So if you have a coin and you cut it into half and each person in the marriage has half of it, you're making an articulation. It's sort of symbolically of the whole divided into the individual parts of the marriage, but they are together one. It is also a way of sharing the wealth of the marriage to both parties. It becomes, and now if you think back to your fairy tale lore, it becomes the thing that is the proof of the marriage or of the relationship of child to parent um, because the bit of coin can go off and then is magically discovered as a necklace around the neck of the orphaned kid or pick any of a variety of stories. We actually know that cut coins are part of this ceremony, but we tend not to focus on them because we are looking for rings. So I bring you the cut coin. Now, a lot of people have simply said cut coins are mutilated coins. They were used for financial exchange when you didn't have change. And that can be true. But we have so many documents that, particularly the um, merchant class, were using the gift of a coin or a, a coin fragment as part of the um, betrothal moment that I want you to remember this as your sort of symbol of celebration. It's actually a bit of a legal problem for the man. Because there is that moment in the uh, process of getting married where you actually are married. That sounds obvious. Remember I said we don't always have celebrants. So let's talk a little bit about hand fasting. There's that moment where you decide that you two are going to become one and you're going to live happily ever after. And if it's a noble wedding, that's going to be contracted 
and the lawyers are usually going to be involved. And if the lawyers aren't involved, there's probably going to be really messy church litigation about five years down the road when your previous marriage, <coughs> unsanctioned by the family, might come to light. We've got some examples of those. But um, to get married in the Middle Ages, you needed to have intent, and you needed to have a signal, and you needed to put it in the present tense. Okay? Intent, signal, and verb tense. I tell you what, the medieval theologians, they could make those angel, angels dance on the heads of pins. So if you were to say, I will take you as my wife, I have not married anyone, I have cast it in the future, and if we sleep together and you wind up pregnant, not my problem. Because while I had the intent, I have not put it in present tense. But if I say, I do take you as my wife, and I give you a half coin, or I give you a ring, or I give you a necklace, or I give you a book, or I give you a feather pillow, I had intent, I have given you a symbolic something, and I put it in the present tense. And so, at that moment, they are lawfully man and wife. And what is then challenging is if it's just the two of us and there are no witnesses, the family can contest it, the church can contest it, the person you were originally engaged to can contest it. Uh, there winds up being a fair bit of litigation for people who did these uh, three-part weddings of the less formal variety. And so very often you want to do that ceremonial in front of witnesses who can attest to your marital status, particularly if you're going to use the marriage in lieu of any sort of will, it helps to make sure that the right people get your goods if you should die suddenly. Um, but a wed can be a coin, a wed can be a necklace, a wed can be a pillow, almost anything will do. And so it's not really until the 15th century that the ring winds up being the standard thing, and I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. That's because the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian had a really fabulous ring with a diamond, and everybody thought it was the coolest thing on the planet, so everybody wanted one. So in the 16th century, you start moving towards rings with gemstones. But for the 13th, 14th, 15th century, sort of anything goes. You had a question. Even a, so in English law, even a peppercorn is a sufficient gift to be the signal that you have actually exchanged your vows. So the celebrant is ancillary. You want the celebrant because there is uh, an opportunity to sanctify the marriage. Of course, marriage is a sacrament. And so if you have the resources, you may well have a church wedding. But it can follow on this moment of actual wedding um, with the intent, the gift, and the, um, the present tense. Right. Hand fasting, then. So as you're coming along, you have a gift of some sort, and then you very often will signal your status. If you don't have a ring, you might just put the hands together. And I mentioned just in passing, one of the things that this hand ceremony is doing is calling to mind the feudal process. When um, someone is pledging to serve uh, someone further up the hierarchy, they will put their hands between that of their leader lord uh, and pledge their service to that individual and it makes a, a kind of binding contract lord to 
uh, servant about how they're going to relate to one another. Um, the lesser person is going to provide labor or is going to provide goods. Um, the noble person is going to provide care and uh, support and countenance and safety and protection and all of those things. So some of the symbolism of the hand fasting is putting the woman into that relationship to her married lord, that there is uh, going to be a relationship in which she is going to be a good wife in the marriage. Uh, of course, a lot of this is written by folks who we nowadays might think are a little bit misogynistic about the assumptions of what women were capable of, but she's pledging to serve her husband. He is pledging to care for her. Um, so that hand fasting becomes a symbol of the relationship. Here, no ring. We're just having the celebrant put the two hands together so that they are bound uh, one to the other. Again, here, clasping hands in the front of the church, not inside the church, having that ceremonial out in public where a whole variety of people can see it. Um, again, hand clasping, celebrant. Um, the backdrop sort of suggests church, but you really can't tell. Many manuscripts have what I think of as the schwa neutral, neutral background that looks kind of like we tiled it, but it's just a way of filling space in manuscripts. Uh, and then um, the decretals, again, another hand ceremony. Witnesses, everybody with their hair up, uh, so a little bit fancy, um, and a lot of that luxurious blue. Um, I think this is my last example. The Psalter in ours, the Bedford Psalter. Here we are gathered together. Um, again, she's got that blue lined cloak. They're clasping hands. You'll see that the celebrant is physically bringing them together. So sometimes we have the celebrant, and the event might be in church. Sometimes it's outside on the porch of the church. whole variety of areas. Um, so let's pause for a moment and tell the story of uh, Bohemond I of Antioch, so think Crusades, um, and Constance de France. And they are getting married. Um, but it is not the original contracted marriage that uh, Constance was taking on. Instead, Bohemond came up after he had had some opportunity to fight with armies. And he basically said, most eligible woman in the kingdom, I want that. Uh, and she actually canceled her betrothal, arguing that it had all been in the future tense, and then went off and got married with great celebration. Um, and uh, they uh, were, the marriage itself was celebrated by the bishop, who had to agree that her not one, not two, but three previous engagements, none of them had used the present tense. It worked as an argument. There might have been some strong arming in the background. We'll never know. But at, that, at their actual wedding ceremony, it was really clear that part about weddings are really about what you're trying to do politically. Our dear groom tried to get the nobility to come back with him to take up further war in the Holy Land. And we used it as a recruiting opportunity, which is not the deeply romantic wedding that we tend to think of when we are imagining weddings. But this is sort of status quo for the Middle Ages. They're political moments. You're forging your alliances. You're determining who is the most powerful and who has the most access um, to the uh, sort of marriage signals of how we're all going to come together politically. Great. Porches, houses, and other locations. You can get married anywhere. In fact, you can get married in a whole different range of places. Legal records from the time specify some of the spaces that one can get married on the road, in the pub, at friends' houses, at the church door, on the church porch, that's particularly important. And even in bed, 
again, why in bed? Because you only need three things, intent, a gift, and a present tense. And in the heat of the moment, a few weddings were had. Um, those wind up more often litigated than um, one would hope, but there it is. Um, so here we have uh, an example. There they are standing outside. Glad it's not a day like today. It's not raining in this picture. Everyone is grateful. Um, but you are standing very distinctly in front of a church portico on the porch. Um, you do actually have the priest having come out. Often you will have the, the sort of wedding occur outside and then you'll go in for the sanctification and then you'll go out and have the party. Um, so it can be a multi-stop. We'll talk more about ceremonial in that third class. Uh, third lecture. Um, so uh, outside the church, big place to have weddings. You are now attuned to it. You're going to see it everywhere. Um, here we are. It's clearly an indoor location. There is an arch again. There's a celebrant. Um, but you look up at the top with all of this funky architectural stuff. Looks like it's probably church-like architecture. So it's, it is a sort of mix of indoor and outdoor space. Yet again, here we are very clearly outdoors. We're down the steps from the church porch. We haven't yet climbed up to be inside of the church, but other people are standing up there, so we will um, have an occasion to work with them later. But here we are, nice celebrant telling you he's important because he's got the hat. Uh, and there we are uh, with the hand fasting ceremony going on. Um, so that ability to have a variety of places. Here we are at the boat landing, celebrating uh, the meeting of the betrothed couple for the first time on a river. Um, so uh, it really can be almost anywhere. They are shaking hands, just like a regular handshake. This is a multi-scene um, event. We'll come back to it in a future le uh, lecture. So. Why do you even need a celebrant? Because the sanctity of marriage, that ability to be sanctified through the sacrament of marriage is important in a Christian tradition. And I do not know enough to talk about Jewish tradition. There are studies of Jewish weddings in the Middle Ages. Um, and there is a little bit more, it seems to be, from my secular perspective, more of a continuity of wedding tradition on the Jewish side than the Christian, but I'm going to keep my comments on the Christian side because, as I said up front, I am a non-expert here in the area of marriage, and I wanted to have something cogent, um, so I'm going to stand other traditions off to the side with my own apologies. Um, but the blessings can be very important, and so you will start to notice in some of the pictures we'll see over the course of the term, you'll have little hand gestures pointing up, showing that this is that moment of sacrament, um, and you have the uh, signals of agreement and the hands coming together. Together. And so that's something to be alert to. We'll talk again about the, the sort of stages of marriage in Lecture 3. So what else do we have in weddings? We do have our musicians. Musicians are a great thing, particularly for a musicologist. You're always looking for musicians. Um, so here you have uh, the marriage of Niccolo de Bologna, and there is our young lass, uh, who is exchanging the ring, and standing right behind her is somebody playing a viol, a bowed instrument. So they have come processing through the street. There are a group of musicians. We don't know what they're playing, but everybody is going along and having a good time. And that procession and the drawing of attention and the music, become then part of the symbology for weddings. So here you have Giotto, um, and the, um, uh, you have the um, procession again, the wedding procession in. Um, but there you have, again, a bowed instrument. This time, um, I suppose it's a viol, but it's a little bit big for a viol, so it could be one of the uh, near relative instrumentally. 
Notice that the musician is coming early, um, sort of setting the stage, drawing people's attention as she's arriving. And we will see a lot more musicians over the course of the course, because that's one of my little footnote pieces that I notice when I am doing this analysis. But here you see him playing the instrument. Um, you also know that he is wreathed in a little laurel crown. So he is presumably also a poet, uh, so would presumably be improvised revising poetry and accompanying himself in one of those sort of standard formulaic improvisatory traditions. We know that that is how instrumentalists are trained. We actually have documents talking about how, in, particularly in the 14th century, the musicians will like take a break from court and be paid to go off to one of the big fairs up north where they will learn new repertoire and to come back to court and bring all of the newest music with them when they come. And that music was all taught by ear. So um, instrumental music is circulating through um, monkey see, monkey do. Vocal music is the part that's written down. And then um, from the chapel of Queen Theodolinda in Monza, Again, a very elaborate scene. You can see down at the lower level um, the folks who are um, there, gathered there to celebrate. But up at the top, again, you have your musicians. Um, and for the first time, we see ridiculous hairdress of the Middle Ages. So that also happens in art. My last of the like formal art pieces for today is going to be another one of those sort of Christi uh, Christian translations of the wedding ceremony. This is Joachim and Anne, and there they are. You notice the bride is wearing red, but has a blue undergarment. So the, again, the mix of colors, but the high, and she's got uh, elaborate sleeves with a slash to them. She's got uh, ornate embroidery across the front. Um, he's wearing his uh, short coat over the lovely tights, a uh, very, uh, very uh, contemporaneous look, I'm afraid. Um, you have the celebrant. You have the party being prepared in the background. You have the witnesses. You have the announcement from the trumpet player. And you have a whole bunch of people talking about what's going on. Well, what's going on is a wedding. And of course, part of the wedding ceremony can be the public bedding. And so the last part of today's lecture, um, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the bedding ceremonies, which can be elaborate. I'm not going to talk about first night, the rights of the nobleman to sleep with the young lady, um, because we've overdone that. It is true that the nobleman might actually sleep with someone. Sometimes it happens on a night of her marriage. That's a terrible thing. I don't mean to diminish it, but he could sleep with her pretty much any time he wanted to because he was the law. So it is, we have tended to take the sort of 18th century focus on first night rights and read them back into the Middle Ages. Um, but it was not a period in which you assumed that you had the right to your own body. The um, culture did not make that presumption. So first night ceremonies are not a thing. Um, there are no formal ceremonials of um, deflowering the virgin before she's passed to her husband. That's a bit of a, it makes really good romance stories, so it's part of our cultural narrative, but it is not in fact part of the documented approach to weddings of the Middle Ages. However, the public bedding is. And so you will take the couple and the, the group that attended the wedding may, may, doesn't have to, but may go with them as they go to that first night's bed and may or may not undress them on the way and will stand around and laugh at them as they are getting ready 
for that first intimate act, assuming it's a first time. Um, and afterwards, yes, sometimes they do actually put the sheets out the window to demonstrate that she was a virgin and had that virginal bleeding from the first night. And so, yes, there are advice books um, for young women getting married couple examples from the 14th century at least that suggest that you have blood from a pig available in case that staining of the sheets doesn't work. Uh, practical solutions to individual problems. Um, so the public bedding, you'll notice here they start out their, whoops, Sorry. Start out, they have just come from the ceremonial, and there they are in this lovely bed. Uh, and presumably in the morning, they'll hang the sheets out, and everyone will know what's going on. Well, that accompaniment can sometimes be very formal and um, sort of celebratory, particularly if you're talking about a king's daughter. You are not going to subject her to a lot of ridicule. But if you are of a lesser class, you may actually be uh, subject to uh, a ceremony that I will spend the rest of the time talking about is Carivari, which is the medieval French pronunciation that I learned, but which in modern Louisiana is known as chivalry. Um, same word, new pronunciation, things happen over the multiple centuries. So the uh, Carivari uh, is a ceremony of procession, after the wedding, usually after the wedding, sometimes to enforce a wedding, um, in which people are going to do mumming and accompany, we'll talk about that, um, and accompany the married couple to the bedchamber for what comes next. So we're going to talk about the most famous example of the Carivari and one of the great works of Western art, the Roman de Fauvel. Um, which is, in fact, it's not a, this is not a true color, but it is a little bit uh, brown and reddish as the ink has faded over time. This is a manuscript held in the BN. The Roman de Favel, the story of Favel, is one that was written in 1314, so early 14th century, and is put into this really elaborate productive production copy in uh, 1316 to 18 with a bunch of editions. The editions are new lines of poetry, oops, yep, new lines of poetry, music, art. And the production of the manuscript of Favel was done at court at a time of political unrest. And the story of Favel is a political satire. Favel himself is a dung-colored donkey, and they use the pun dun and dung in the manuscript. Um, he leaves his stable, as you see here, and he moves upstairs into court, where fortune makes him the master of the royal household. Favel, whose name stands for flattery, avarice, uh, vanity, Envy, lust, um, and um, lachete, yeah, lust, uh, favel. Um, in other words, a, an agglomeration of sins is meant to be the chancellor, because who doesn't hate the chancellor, right? Uh, so there is Favel out. He's made his way to court, even though he doesn't belong there, because our chancellor came from the lower classes and is now ruling France, and it's terrible. Um, and Fortune has elevated him above his rank, and so Favel is teaching people how to do things. And if you know the phrase, to curry favor, it actually comes from this manuscript, because everybody wants to brush the coat of the donkey. They want to curry Favel. That becomes to curry favor. And then things go really wrong. So Favel has been, uh, it's a manuscript, you can see here how elaborate the page is with musical examples, some of which are some of the most elaborate polyphony of the early 14th century and some of which are not. And we're going to focus on the parts that are not because that's the Carivari part. Um, the additions, uh, as you can see, you started out with a base story that was about 3,000 lines. You add 3,000 lines, 169 musical pieces, 77 illustrations, and it winds up a different kind of object. So 
here is Pavel, our donkey friend. And he has been treated so well by fortune that he thinks that he should marry her. She'll have none of it. But she does say, oh, I've got the perfect wife for you. Here's vain gloire, vain glory, uh, because that is truly suited to your station. And you notice, here they are with the hand ceremony, getting engaged. So the wedding ceremony is actually depicted, and it goes on and on. There's a banquet. It has at least three courses, because we get three different pictures. There is uh, there's a joust. There is a competition of the virtues and the vices. Guess who wins? It wouldn't be the virtues. And then there's the bedding ceremony, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of our time. The karivari, this folk ritual, this enforcement. So typically, it's a folk parade. It has masks, uh, which is the mumming part. If you know the Mummers Parade in Philadelphia on New Year's, uh, yeah, that is a form of mumming. Uh, so is the Karivari. It has homemade and found objects. If you look really closely, those are not drums, they're pans. So you just take what you've got around the household, and you bang it, and you make horrible noise with it to accompany uh, the parade as it goes down the street. And there's an element of riot, of topsy-turvy. It's a little bit scary as you go through it. And the Karivari then has a social function. It's both celebrating the marriage, people say. It's scaring off the evil spirits, a little bit like we shoot off fireworks on New Year's to scare off the evil spirits. We don't really think we're doing that, but we also know that that's what we're doing. And the medieval Karivari lives in much that same space. We don't actually believe that we are scaring off evil spirits, but we're going to do it because we're scaring off the evil spirits. So you get to have a double think on that one. It's also used as a form of social control. We have documented Karivaris that are, uh, particularly in France, um, where they use a Karivari if there has been uh, an inappropriate marriage or adultery or um, if uh, there is a, a delay in uh, production of children in particular, then you shame the couple into the appropriate social activities. Um, oops. I did not mean to do that, sorry. Well, that's a good spot anyway. Let me toggle out for a moment. So um, I'm going to play a little clip from the video. No, hold on. Forget how you. Sorry, I need to convince my PowerPoint to stand down. All right, we'll do this. There we go. So the dress up in costume. They're ringing things and making noises, shouting. And they're bringing along the marriage couple. Yes, that's uh, stylized sexual materials for the man, dressing them up, taking them to the household. He says, if you don't want that husband, I've got a better one for you. And then at the end, they pay off the mummers and off they go. 
drat. All right. Um, so the Karivari, um, is ceremonial with people dressed up in their costume and shouting rude things, making rude gestures, making rude uh, allusions to things. Give me just a moment, and I will return to my PowerPoint. So here is another example of a Karibari um, from the 15th century. Again, you see the crowd. You see that it is outside the window. You can see, if you will, the lass uh, up in the window. Again, that signaling of social, hmm, social control. In Return of Martin Guerre, that excerpt that we just saw, that we do actually have documented the presence of the Karibari to shame the couple because they have not yet produced children. If you want children, get another husband. He has not been appropriately carrying on his marital duty. And so the town is gathered to sort of enforce the intent of the wedding for the two of them. Likewise, in Fauvel, the Carivari is there as Fauvel and Vainlois get married. And it both is that celebratory moment of here we are and there's a parade and we're going to have a good time. And it is at the same time and with the same materials a critique of the sins of France marrying up with the arrogance of Vainglory. Um, and so the Carivari is lovely because it points both directions. So here's a modern example of a chivalry. Um, you'll notice the costumed heads. You'll notice, uh, in this case, you've got uh, sort of folk, the folk-type instruments um, and lots of jangles and bangles, if you will. Um, that is very much part of the tradition. And um, in the interest of time, I think instead of playing the excerpt from uh, Favel, I'll have it queued up at the start of class next time, but I want to just show you a few more pictures and I'll sing a couple of the sautes chansons, which are used as part of the Karivari. So you have three levels in this image. At the lowest level, uh, you, down, um, down here at the bottom, you have the mummers gathering up, you have the guy doing the dancing step, you have the pots and pans and a bottle being used, you have another guy with a pot and a spoon. Then in the middle you have actual instruments, but you have more of masks. So a uh, lion mask in the bas back, you've got something with ears there, and then up at the very top there's Favel getting married. And you would read bottom to top in these illustrations. So we are seeing the crowd as they accompany the couple to the uh, bedding ceremony. Well, what are, the, what are the crowd singing? These are not nice songs. I mentioned that Favel has some of the most elaborate polyphony of the 14th century. And then you have the scene of the Karivari itself. And you see here in, on the same page, you have the words, sote chanson, foolish songs. Um, the idea of sauté chanson is to call out short little musical bits. They're not full songs in any sense. They're just speech songs. So there are a set of them. Here, let me run through. Um, you'll see here, this is one of the longer ones. Um, La jour or <clears throat> Not very elaborate, uh, pretty syllabic, one word at a time. Um, they get shorter and shorter as you go through the ceremony. You can imagine people running along the street, and in comes somebody, so l'autre jour, up top, then down here. On a le can, on a le can, le can, le can, le, le, le can. What is he saying? In Helican, Helican being the puppet or the, the actor, um, the puppet, Hel, Hel, the puppet. 
Does it make sense? No. It's not a, a full thought. It's the idea of the singing, the idea of noise riotous noise making that the scribe is trying to capture. This one, um, <clears throat> elle l'on sorry, elle est son pour aussi de nos dames. They're afraid of those, our women. Or my favorite, <clears throat> Trente quatre pes moise, thirty four moldy farts. <laughs> to accompany the wedding of Fauvel. So you have numbers of these. It's one of our only sources for this folk tradition from this period of France. Because these are the kind of thing you write down. No scribe is going to take the time to elegantly write out 34 moldy farts. <laughs> Unless you're in that mood where you're really mocking out everything that's going along politically. And that's what these are actually doing. It's both Favel and the ceremony and the Carivari who could possibly object to talking about folk ritual in the story about a donkey because it's clean, it's clear, we're not naming names. But everybody also knows that what happens when Favel is inappropriately, when all of these sins are inappropriately matched up with Vainguard, you're going to wind up with a bunch of little Favelettes running around. So here you have again um, pictures of the Carivari, and there we are with the image of the bedding. So that gives you a kind of short introduction to visual renditions of marriage for the Middle Ages. Um, and I'll just remind you, next week we'll be talking more seriously about funerals and deploration. But for today, what questions do you have? Yes? <clears throat> ah, Dowry practices are really different from place to place to place, but mostly yes, um, unless your women in, were in short supply, in which case it was the men who were investing in the marriage. Um, so in Italy, um, you needed a lot of money to marry off uh, women. That's one of the reasons that Italian convents are so numerous, because you can't afford to marry all your daughters. And so one of the things in the 12th and 13th century, you start establishing religious foundations so that you can put your, your um, younger daughters or daughters who are disfigured into convents, and you will invest that dowry then in a one or two high-alliance high marriages. In England, on the other hand, the dowry practices are a little bit more equitable, and the benchmark dowry is a lot lower. Dowries in England are more used to establish household, so the size of the dowry is more commensurate with what families can afford. In England, more of your daughters have the opportunity to get married. So it really is a social construct that ends, that the sort of uh, affects then the way in which the society organizes itself. So dowry is a huge question in these. It's one of the things that you negotiate. You know, how many of the, how many, how many heads of uh, the sheep flock are going to go with the daughter into the new household? Yes, sir. Yes, that is, that is documented, and sometimes, uh, the, sometimes things get out of hand because people have been drinking most of the day. Um, and so you do wind up with some cases of chivalry in court. Um, the kidnapping of a bride and taking her is, again, in, in the, it's fun if you're the people on the doing side. As I, I like the clip from Return of Martin Guerre because I think it gives you a, a sense that it is not always so fun on the recipient side, even though you're supposed to take it in good spirit and you're supposed to pay off the mummers when they're done. Yes, in the back? Um, the picture you showed me after, I looked at one chivalry in my lifetime, and I had one in a fibula. Ah. And that picture shows a fibula. Yes. Um, and so, yes, you could, you could put the uh, individual into the wheelbarrow and move her around. Uh, the, and um, in at least one of the documents, the, the bride gets up and runs away. 
And so then the uh, part of the complaint is that it delays the um, it delays the marriage, and then there's um, something comes through and something with the cattle, um, and I don't remember the details anymore, but the, because you don't have the wedding when it was scheduled, then essentially not enough of the goods come over. Um, so that we find out about these ceremonies in the weirdest ways. I could take, let's see, one last question. Yeah. Actually, it's often the parents who signed the betrothal documents, um, but our depictions are of the wedded couple because it's different than photography. Um, they are doing the symbolic representation of what's happening as opposed to the authentic capture of what happened in the physical moment. So it is the two individuals who are going to be married who wind up depicted, even when it is dad who did the signing for the woman, uh, which is usually the case. Um, and so it's an excellent question and it does make us think like you do have to do that double step what actually happened in this moment versus how is it being represented to us so well thank you all for your attention this morning look forward to seeing you next week